I am reminded of Oscar Wilde's lines. There are two kinds of people who spread happiness. The first category are people who go ha spread happiness wherever they go. And the second category of the people who spread happiness is wherever they go. I hope I do not fall into the second category and try to brief out my paper as much as uh, possible. Uh, my comparative study is between the three uh, line, uh, among the three poems, The Solitary Reaper and Torti Pathar. Uh, Solitary Reaper, I don't have to introduce, it is written by Wordsworth and uh, Torti Pathar by Suri Kam Tripathi Nirala. I have contradicted these two poems with Saroshni Naidu's The Padda Nasheen. I need to use this? Okay, but I'm vertically challenged for this. Anyways. <laughs> But guys, I always compromise. I'm horizontally accomplished as well. OK. <laughs> uh, Solitary Reaper and Torti Pathar have many things in common. The very title, Solitary, says that of loneliness, Torti Pathar is about a woman working alone. The match in the uh, locations as well, where bo these both women are found working on the highlands or in the highway area. It's a very common feature that even today when we travel, we see women working on the highways and they're all alone. Uh, about their, I have a lot of similarities between uh, similarities of these two poems, but I'll try to cut short as much as possible to make my point towards the end of clear. Uh, we'll talk of their loneliness. Uh, Wordsworth has very beautifully written about like how she is single, how she's alone all by herself, and how she's trying to entertain herself by singing a song although it is melancholy and he does not understand the language, yet he tries to feel it through the way that she is singing, through her voice. And Torti Pathar is suffering of more of physical. She is uh, engrossed in her work and she is exposed to the hardships of the location. I would like to, at this point of time, quote a few of these lines, like, Guru Hathod Hath, Karti Bar Bar Prahar, Praya Huvi Do Pahar Va Torti Pathar. She is continuously hitting the stones, working very laboriously, and it is afternoon, the shift of the day time, and yet her continuation shows that she's engrossed in her work. And reaping and singing by herself, alone she cuts and binds the grain, and sings a melancholy strain. I saw her singing at her work, and over the sickle bending. There is a continuity of singing, bending, working, you know, uh, reaping. All this continuous form shows that she is engrossed with her work and doing it continuously uh, with a lot of dedication. But if you look off the suffering or the hardships, I think Thurti Pathar is more of physical suffering. Because uh, Solitary Reaper, the Wordsworth, does not much understand the language in which the lady is singing. So he feels it that maybe it is of a sad song because of her voice. But here, the uh, Surya Kantri Party very clearly shows like Koi na chaya dar, ped vah jiske tale baithi hui swikar, chad rahi thi dhup, garmiyo ke din, diva ka tam tamata roop, jhulasti hui lu, jalti hui bhu, praya hui do pahar, vah torti pathar. Lot of, uh, you know, connotations where uh, the physical hardships, the circumstances in which she is working and she has nobody for her but for herself to work with. Now when I compare these two women working very hard, Saroshni Naidu in her poem, The Parda Nasheen, has shown her another woman. Quite contradictory, this woman in Parda is of richness. She is of... I think I need to start it from the middle. Okay, I'll just give the introduction for film adaptations first. Film adaptation is one of the concepts of the film theory. Whereas the other concepts are perception, narrative structure, valuation, etc. In general, adaptation is translating from one medium to another medium. Film adaptation is the transfer of a written work to a film. So it can be called as a derivative work as it is derived from another source, which is of course a very famous in its own field. So common form of a film is, is generally a novel. But film adaptation also includes non-fictitious works like autobiography, comic books, journals, etc. According to the film theorist Dudley Andrew, film adaptation is the most narrow and provincial area of film theory. He says that adaptation is both a leap and a process, and it offers privileged locus of analysis. He divides the possible modes of relation between the text and the film into three, namely borrowing, intersection, fidelity to transformation. Trans um, studying film adaptations is also considered as 
uh, critical analysis on the film or on the book which is taken. The same mode of translation from a book to a film is studied under intersemiotic translation in the field of translation studies. In his article, Rachel Wisbert suggests a possibility of relation between translation and other disciplines. Translation studies as a discipline that, due to its capacity to encompass intersemiotic translation as one of its objects, can give a unique perspective of, on topics which are usually dealt within the framework of other disciplines such as literature, theater, and film studies. So the starting point for this line of thought can be an argument made by the semiotician Rom Rom Roman Jakobsen in his article on linguistic aspects of translation. Jakobsen claimed that the meaning of a sign is its translation into another sign or sequence of signs in the same language, in another language, or in another semiotic language, example the visual medium. Following Jakobsen, Itmar Ivan Johar elaborated a theory of transfer which applies to all variations of the following phenomenon. A theory of transfer rooted in his polysystem theory has been used in research dealing with transfer within one language and from literature to cinema. So, however, there is a lot of research done in film adaptation in film studies. Not that sort of research has been done under intersemiotic translation in translation studies. Uh, my case study here is Malgudi Desh, which is a collection of short stories by Akin Narayan. These stories written with simple style and characteristic gentle irony portray the variety and the color of Indian life. These Malgudi Desh um, are adapted into television adaptations of short stories this is Indian television series of Malgudi Days. It was produced by T.S. Narsimhan in the production of Padmarat films in 1986. The series was directed by late Kannada actor and director Shankar Nag. The Hindi translation was given by Sharad Joshi and screenplay and dialogue was by Ranjit Chaudhary. So I uh, tried to find out the, uh, I tried to make a comparative study between the short story and its television adaptation in this paper. So I selected two stories for this and confine myself to one story that's Ishwaran. So a story of two to three pages is directed into an episode which lasts from 20 to 25 minutes of period. So the first story which I would like to take is Ishwaran. Ishwaran is a tragic story of a student who fails to pass his intermediate exam repeatedly and finally passes but unfortunately he drowns in the Sarayu river. The opening scene of the episode is just like the opening scene in the story where the whole student community in Malgudi was convulsed with excitement near the Senate Hall of the Albert Mission College. The main difference between reading the story and watching the film is narration. As we go through the story, there will be a narrator, either a character from the story or the author of the story. But the film may or may not have a narrator as such. The moving Im images themselves narrate the story to the viewers and most of the information narrated in the story is changed sometimes as conversations so that they convey the message to the viewer. Similarly, the introduction to the character Iswaran is given by a student to his fellow friend when Iswaran accidentally dashes him. He then goes back home. The conversation that takes place between Iswaran and his father is just as same in the story. But after that, he goes into to get fresh up and there Outside, his father scolds him, showing all his disgust, which is not an element of the story. This is followed by the director to make the audience aware of his father's anguish and at the same time shows Ishwaran weeping inside and then becoming careless of his father's comments and leaving out. He says to his mother, saying, don't wait for me for dinner, as he was going to movie and will have dinner in some hotel. On his way to the picture palace, he comes across his friends who ask him to join them, but he refuses and first gives a fake number of his hall ticket and then says his number as 501. He then goes to Anand Bhavan, a restaurant, greets him and then goes to the movie. According to the story, he goes to the Anand Bhavan only after the movie, but here the director introduces the scene earlier. This may be because, according to the story, Ishwaran watches the movie twice and between the shows, he visits the restaurant once and after the show he goes there for the second time. So in this way there are a lot of differences between the story and the TV adaptations and each difference or each modification
I express very much thanks to you all. Eleven young scholars, ha they have presented their uh, papers. Okay. Uh, that is Bhavesh Kumar. Bhavesh Kumar, he has presented his paper on a post-colonial reading of Sadat Hasan Mantos, uh, Toba Teixing and uh, Naya Khanon. Uh, Toba Teixing se humare bache bhi sabhi jante hain, uh, kyunki Urdu mein bhi ye padhaya jata hai, English mein bhi padhaya jata hai, aur Hindi mein to uh, hum logo ne kaam karaya hai, kaam kara rahe hain, aur Manto is our favorite writer, everywhere in English also. Uh, and uh, next, <clears throat> uh, Mahesh Sharma, he has presented his paper on comparative study of Eastern and Western aesthetics. You know, aesthetics, study of aesthetics is a very tough job. Uh, Hindi mein to hum sab bahut darte hain, Rasa Siddhan se aur uh, uh, Nagendra, Dr. Nagendra has done wonderful uh, work on Rasa Siddhant. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mahesh Sharma has presented his paper in a very beautiful manner, in a very systematic way. Mai to mai kahunga ke hum sab aap logon se bade labhan with hai. We are very much impressed, labhan with hai, I'm bolte hai, impressed uh, by your presentation and uh, the, the way of uh, study, analyzing the things. And at the same time, uh, uh, Safia Begum, she has presented her paper on representation of history, culture, and nationhood, a comparative study of Kurutal and Haider's River of Fire and Fireflies in the Mist. Unke do novels par inhone bahut achha kaam kiya hai, khud ayin apa, Kurutal and Haider. Ayn Apa ke naam se wo jane jati hai. Ayn Apa, jitni wo Urdu mein famous hai, utna hi famous wo Hindi mein hai. Mein to aksar, mera ek paper hai, Muslim discourse mein, waha mein ye siddh kiya ki wo Urdu ki nahi, wo Hindi ki hai. Jitna wo popular hai, or lokapriya hai Hindi, Urdu mein, utna hi wo lokapriya hai Hindi mein bhi. Aapne bahut achha kaam kiya hai, is mein aur bahut saare इश्यूज हैं जिन पर आप बात कर सकती हैं आ, मैं जानता हूं कि यहां समय की बड़ी समस्या थी पाबंदी थी फिर भी आ, इस इस लिमिटेशंस में आपने आ, अपनी बातों को बहुत अच्छी तरीके से हमारे सामने रखा ट्विंकल हैज प्रेजेंटेड हर पेपर ऑन इंटर सिमियोटिक ट्रांसलेशन ए कंपैरेटिव स्टडी ऑफ शार्ट स्टोरीज विद देयर टेलीविजन एडॉप्शन एडॉप्शंस पर आपने बात की और देन अरिजित प्रधान, she has presented her paper on indignity and issue of ecological resistance महाश्वेता देवीज नावल रेन्यार अधिकार एंड जेम्स कैमरॉन्स रिसेंट अवतार पर आपने बात की ये एक बहुत अच्छा पेपर था जिस पर हम गौर गौर कर सकते हैं और देख सकते हैं कि कहाँ से कहाँ हम कंपैरिजन कर सकते हैं कंपैरिजन करने के हॉरिजॉन्स इतने बढ़ गए हैं इतने विस्तार हैं कहीं पोइट्री को ले जाकर हम सिनेमा के साथ कहीं सिनेमा को ले जाकर हम महाकाव्य के साथ जोड़ सकते हैं विजय कुमारी एंड जी गोविंदया की जो पेपर था Making a difference means making a fail of a difference. A comparative study of Moby Dick with special reference to uh, biblical characters. एक बहुत अच्छा पेपर था जिसके uh, आधार पर हमने देखा um, कि कैसे uh, Moby Dick uh, and उनके biblical characters कैसे एक साथ वो काम करते हैं. Uh, Victor David Saab का ambivalence in uh, Kipling's plain tales from the hill. एक नए तरीके से इन्होंने Kipling's के writings को देखने की यहाँ कोशिश की है। यानी शोकमारी, she has presented her paper on new directions in comparative literature theory पर आपका बड़ा focus था और बाद में 
Farahana, a comparative study of William Wordsworth poem, The Solitary Reaper, Surikant Tripathi, Nirala, yes, uh, Torti Pathar and Sarojini Naidu's The Parda Nasheen. Uh, तीन पoइम्स को लेकर आपने आ, काम किया है आ, मैं दो पoइम्स मैं नहीं जानता तोड़ती पत्थर को मैं जानता हूँ तोड़ती पत्थर आ, हमेशा के लिए ये वर्ग्रीन पoइम है पोइट्री है जिस पर लोग काम करते रहे हैं कंपैरिजन होते रहे हैं वी आर थैंकफुल टू यू इस तरह ग्यारह युवा लोगों ने स्कॉलर्स ने हमारे सामने अपनी बातें रखी है आ, I express my thanks on behalf of English department, on behalf of Maulana Ajad National Urdu University, and on behalf of me. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think we should uh, proceed towards lunch. Thank you. Clear, first of all. It is the post 9 11 fiction, the state and the global futures in England, America, and beyond. And uh, I'm a bit sorry. This my paper seems a bit of means anti-Islamic and anti-Muslim. But this is not my approach. This is a Western uh, uh, perception. Leave that. Uh, and the before means uh, and the 11 September 2001. It is a day of attack on World Trade Center. This is the kind of monumental dynamism in the era of literary uh, history, history and culture. This particular means attack on World Trade Center changes the perception of the world. And the novelist like, I have taken five novelists, two from England, Ian McEwan and Martin Amis, two from uh, America, Dan DeLillio and Jonathan Safran, one from Pakistan, uh, Josin Hamid. I have two more writers from Afghanistan, but I will skip them. So, if you look at them, uh, the way they are portraying, uh, if you look at them, uh, um, Martin Amis, his novel is Yellow Dog. In that novel, he talks about homosex, uh, homosexuality, and I see some more. Uh, and he said, means the, uh, this Muslim people, means uh, Islam are women haters. They are hater, hater of regions. So the characters in the novel are like porn star and uh, pornographers. So what they are trying to show through this work, it means they are cre uh, creating a kind of binary position between Islam and the West. They are saying that that Islam Islamic means uh, they are means uh, they don't have knowledge and they are showing their personalities through creating pornography and other things. I'll skip here. I'll come to um, Ian Mathewan. Saturday, the novel is set against them. Means uh, there is a huge protest on 15 February 2000, 2003. If you look at the protest, it was in the, at the same time London, Berlin, Paris, and many South Asian countries. And what happens in the midst that protest? There are many countries who are opposing America. Don't attack on Iraq. Because it make, means beating the condition of the 9-11 back. But they say, America says, no, we are giving a kind of liberty to the Iraq. So I will attack. And Iraq, didn't, uh, America didn't get the support of UNO and the United Nations. So what happens again? If you see the means American, sorry, uh, European countries, they are divided against each other. Some are supporting Iraq, America, other are not supporting. And then, there are some characters in the novel. They are representing Saddam Hussein, Al-Qaeda leader this year. Uh, I remember. Uh, Osama bin Laden. Means they are showing how means the Islamic countries are means violent terrorist. I leave this. I will come to the means now American fiction. I have taken two novels only, Falling Man by Dan DeLillo. In that novel, he is, uh, look at the shift of condition in American fiction. They are not portraying means uh, the global politics. They are uh, means, portraying means how means human beings are falling from the burning world trade center. Like picture of means burning human bodies falling from the world trade center. And what is Suja? This picture is the, uh, symbolic of, if you see means after 2003, uh, America is war on Iraq. What kind of mis impression they have means, uh, how they have mis treated the American, uh, sorry, uh, Abu, Ghri Abu Ghri prisoners. Uh. So means they...
finally, what I want to say, just to one line I will say. Just I add two one line. I'll I'll add one more line. We pay the price for it. Probably people are talking about means the globalism, multiculturalism, cosmopolitanism. What happens through these novels? Means there is a kind of dichotomy between Islam and the West. Again, within the West, some European countries on one side and other uh, other side. So in the means the novel of 21st century, who will come up, who has come after 9/11, there is means a means of demise of multiculturalism. They are means split to apart. Okay. Uh, where I was? Yeah. Uh, in fact, I also plan to speak on this particular subject, but I mean, uh, I do not know from it. Uh, so, in a way, my paper is a kind of extension of uh, this paper. I have selected especially some uh, recent Pakistani novels. Opportunity. I am Dr. Babita Justin. I am reader. Uh, in an institute called Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology under the Department of Space in Trivandrum. So my topic is all about a woman. I'm going to talk, you, talk to you about a woman whom all of you know, who had been there in our historical and cultural imagination for around 2,000 to 3,000 years. So um, I have a PowerPoint presentation here. So. Uh, uh, can you go, go to the desktop? Character Shakuntala during the nationalistic period. How Shakuntala became a thread that united the Western interpretations of India and Indian indigen indigenous values and how the character became an interface between two cultures and the transformative stages through which she passed through over ages and Shakuntala as a major metaphor in the nationalistic discourse. Even now, you know, you can see lots of sopaperas, lots of advertisements with the same theme of Shakuntala. But primarily, you know, uh, I'll be looking into the gender aspect, I'll be taking a, a post-colonial view of everything. Can we go to the next slide, please? And uh, we know Shakuntala from Mahabharata you know, from the Adi Parva of Mahabharata, where there was a particular, uh, you know, chapter called Shakuntala Khyayana, where she is n narrated as a very, as a lady, you know, born out of the unison of uh, Menaka as well as Vishwamitra. So there's the sage come, uh, you know, celestial beauty union out there. And she, she, she is born of that or the union, and she is brought up as in Kanwa's ashram. You know the story as well, this much. And it was in Kanwa's ashram she meets Dushyanta, the king, whom she falls in love with. Not in love, but she come, she has a kind of a conditional. She makes a conditional marriage between Dushyanta and herself. She says that yes, I will marry you according to Gandharva Viva. But then, if I get married to you in that way, and if I beget a son out of this license, then definitely he should be the future king. And Dushyanta agreed to the whole thing, and there she conceives a child. And later, after five or six years, when Bharata is of age, he goes to Dushyanta's court, and Dushyanta, does, you know, he, he does not recognize her at all, because, you know, suddenly he is overcome by this particular amnesia. And he doesn't recognize her at all. And then suddenly a celestial. And this, this is where Shakuntala's character becomes very, very important in Mahabharata. Because this was a time when she suddenly bursts out at Dushyanta. She's not a passive woman who is very acquiescent about her fate or destiny. She says that you, you're a spineless king. You, know? you don't even remember having had you know, a liaison with me. And now you don't have the spine to speak out. And there she debates, she argues about her position. And Dushinta also does not give up, you know, she even calls her a whore at one point of time and she bursts out saying that, it is you who is human. I've come out of a very celestial kind of relationship. 
You know, my mother is a celestial beauty and my father is a huge, big sage. It is you who is human. And there's a big debate going there. She is not crestfallen, you know, and she is not the kind of a passive woman who starts crying. You know, you can, you can see such serials in Ramayana, even in TV soap operas, you can see at the drop of the hat, you know, these uh, mythical women start crying and all. And then uh, what happens is that a celestial voice says that, of course, Dushyanta, this is your son, you have to recognize him. Let's go to the next, uh, the next uh, slide. I'm, I'm skipping the birth of an epic and uh, stuff like that because uh, epics, you know, are born from bardic elements, from oral narratives, and that's how probably Mahabharata was also born. And the period of its uh, kind of uh, putting together is from 4th century BC to 4th century AD. That's what the historians tell us. It's probably, you know, we have a multiple uh, plurality of authors out there. 